Hey, tribe of three men and women. So today we have another story coming your way and I am going to share about a unique experience that probably not so many people had around the globe. And to be honest though, at the same time, uh, it's called an uchi deshi experience, uh, Japanese term. Deshi means student, uchi means, means insight, so meaning you're living in the school versus soto deshi is outside student, person who's living outside of school and comes in. So, so uchi deshi is a known experience uh, across the martial arts, uh, martial arts world. Uh, but the programs do differ, and again, not everyone you know goes through that step of actually living in a martial arts school. The martial art that schools that I lived in it was an Aikido school, a Japanese martial art, which uh, I later ended up, ended up teaching and uh, studied for about 15 years or so, I guess, in total. But the other side, which is significant to this story is that the school that I lived in, the martial arts school, was also a spiritual school. So I was practicing, Aikido was the main kind of subject, uh, but also Aikido is a philosophical martial art. If you don't know, it's all about achieving peace instead of conflict, transforming conflict uh, from a violent situation into a non-violent situation. So it's a long story what Aikido is, maybe worth making a whole video about what I consider Aikido philosophy to be, but that's another story. Uh, coming back to the dojo that I lived in, um, uh, Aikido was the main base, so I would train for about, I guess, 15 times per week, morning and evening, every day. Uh, Sunday was an off day, but still sometimes we would train on our, on our own. And then also I did yoga and there was meditation. And my Aikido instructor, I, I say Aikido instructor, but kind of, he was also kind of a spiritual teacher for me. If you watch some of my other stories, you probably know about that. Uh, there's a dark side to the story, but also there's a positive side. And um, at the end of the story, about a few, couple years ago or two, three years ago, uh, we fell up, fell apart. We fell out with my Aikido instructor and uh, in a hard, difficult, tough way, we actually hadn't spoken even one word to each other after we fell out. But again, that's a whole different story. Uh, but after I fell out, you know, I saw a lot of dark things that he did, some things that I don't approve uh, now that I look back. Uh, and not like, you know, not like some terrible, terrible things, but more subtle psychological, social things. And, and kind of when you consider what's a good teacher and what's a bad teacher, uh, I saw some bad things he did, which he didn't necessarily always acknowledge. And uh, that's, uh, and again, also to be fair, none of us is perfect. It's just, I consider that a teacher who's running a community, a leader of a community is, it's important for that person to question himself more than anyone else questions. And I feel that was a part he was lacking in, uh, at least in my, in my perspective, but at the same time, we're not all perfect. And uh, I have to admit also too, I got a lot of good stuff from him. Like uh, if without that experience of living in his martial arts slash spiritual school for three years, I wouldn't be the man I am right now. And of course, yes, after I moved out of his dojo, of his dojo is a martial arts school in Japanese, comfortable word, if you don't know. So I opened my own dojo in my own home country, Lithuania, and uh, with time I developed my own qualities, my own perspectives, and uh, I guess it's kind of like a bit of a Freud and Jung uh, <laughs> type of story. You know, you start together and then you end up going your separate ways. Uh, but yeah, so I also got a lot of good things from him. And uh, I, because, this, despite that though, because we fell out, uh, it's difficult for me, it's been difficult for me in the past couple of years to say anything good about him. I would sometimes say it, but but there's so much negativity between us right now that it's tough for, I have to acknowledge, it's tough for me to, to, to point out the good things. I do that inside of myself, but if the conversation goes about my teacher, naturally I uh, kind of am drawn to say, well, there's a lot of bad things he did, but what I have to admit, there was some good stuff too. And in this video, the reason I'm, I'm saying all of this is then in this video, I decided to try to do my best to focus on the good things that I received from that program, the positive adventures I went through living in the Aikido uh, slash yoga slash meditation school. Uh, but who knows, this is not scripted. I'm doing this in one take, so we never know what exactly I'm gonna talk about, but that's gonna be the direction I'm gonna aim for. I'm gonna try to uh, kind of balance out the scales and, and remember the positive things, not only the dark things about that experience. 
So that being said, let's get started after this sip of coffee. If you have a coffee, watch this video and have a coffee or tea and drink with me. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so we, let's come back to, let's start by coming back to like 2006, 2007. And that's a story where I was still in high school, my last couple of years. A quick recap, if you don't know the story, I decided I will not study and I decided that instead I will do Aikido. And the funny part where the first contact I had with the school, which I later lived in, uh, first of all, because when you think about martial arts and you think about Aikido even more so because it's a very traditional martial art, so there's a lot of traditions involved in it, like traditional clothing and, and Japanese etiquette, Japanese words, a lot of Japanism there. And uh, since it's such a Japanese martial art, you kind of tend to think that if you want to, if you want to learn real Aikido, you need to go to Japan, the source of origin. Or if you want to learn Kung Fu, you need to go to China. Thing is, and I don't want to expand too much into that direction, but uh, in my experience, in my perspective, Japanese are quite rigid. There's a lot of good things in them as well, but but they tend to be very conservative, a bit rigid in terms of following the rules, and I think that sometimes inhibits them from kind of evolving whatever they're doing in terms of uh, things which are related to tradition and Aikido is. And so uh, eventually I came to a conclusion that actually a lot of good stuff uh, Aikido wise evolved outside of Japan. But initially I had that idea, okay, if I wanna learn real Aikido, I need to go to Japan. And when I decided that I will become an Aikido, I want to become an Aikido instructor instead of studying, I learned that an Jideshi program exists. Uh, I initially wanted to go to Japan to study there. But the martial arts school, the Aikido school that I wrote an email to asking if I could become an Uchideshi at their place uh, told me that I need a, a recommendation letter. And uh, at the time, Lithuania didn't have any affiliations of that particular organization, so I was kind of screwed. Uh, I, I didn't have anyone to recommend me. Uh, but uh, I didn't realize in the beginning, I was like, what, 17, 18, 18, I guess, yeah? so pretty young, you know, still naive and didn't know much. So I didn't expect that Uchideshi programs also exist outside of Chan, but I kind of stumbled on that. And I saw a few in the States, but I also realized a few of them are in Europe and I'm European, I'm from Europe. And not in my country, but I found one in France and I wrote an email to that dojo, but they couldn't take me in uh, because the instructor was traveling the world teaching seminars. Uh, but I also found, uh, to my surprise, an Aikido dojo with an Uchideshi program in Switzerland. And that was surprising because I thought, wow, Switzerland, that's kind of weird. And I looked into the website and the instructor was American, uh, which is again surprising. But I looked at his background and there were uh, a lot of good things. Like, you know, he, um, he lived in Japan and he traveled the world and went through India and so on and this meditation, I was like, okay, that, that's cool. That, that fits my name and fits my game. Thing is though, I was so eager to just go out there and devote myself to any Aikido program that I didn't care that much about the details. I wasn't picky. I was just, just give me the chance. And I wrote an email if I could come become a Jideshi and I received a positive answer like, yes, you can come. A uh, funny part of the story, I wrote this whole big long email about all the questions, you know, I mean, remember the fact that I was 18, haven't lived, I traveled the world a bit here and there, but I never lived on my own. So my life experience was pretty limited. And this is the first time I was, initially I went there for three months. So I'm planning for a three months trip to, to a country I don't know. And... Uh, I write this big email about like, so what's the language there? How much money do I need per month? And, you know, should I bring my laptop? And I made this whole long list of questions. And eventually after this big email, I get a single answer back, like a, like a couple of sentences, like, uh, let us know when you're gonna come. Somebody's gonna pick you up in the station, in the train station, looking forward to see you. That was it. And I was like, that works with me. <laughs> So I convinced my parents eventually to let me go. And after I finished high school, I finished in June and I waited a couple of months. And then in August, I went on a bus trip to Switzerland, which is like a, f it was actually, it went longer than it was supposed to. So it went for like 32 hours bus trip, barely without any stops. That was like, that was pretty heavy. 
and I arrived into Zurich. Uh, I had to go to a different city eventually, but I went to Zurich with my bus and I needed to take a train there, but the bus was late. So I got stuck in the train station because all the, the trains already left. So it's midnight and I'm like, well, might as well just go and communicate with people around. I was, I was at the day I was very communicative. Now I don't like to talk to random people, strangers so much. But back in the day, I was like, yeah, let's get to know each other. And I walked to some people of my age and I would just chat with them. And and the funny part is I didn't know anything about Switzerland. I didn't prepare for that trip much whatsoever. I just kind of went like blind. I didn't know anyone in that dojo. So it was like kind of blind faith. And I was talking to these kids and of my age and they were telling me like, oh, so well, uh, now I actually forgot is I think Zurich is the capital of yeah I think it's the capital of Switzerland I'm like there oh well Zurich is the capital of Switzerland I was like really I didn't know that it's not Geneva is it I think Geneva is just a big important city anyway so and then they tell me oh you, they're they're where, where you're going they talk French I was like French I didn't know that <laughs> turns out that area it's a really interesting thing about Switzerland Switzerland is divided into kind of three parts and they each part talks in a different language. Crazy, crazy. It's a tiny, small country, uh, smaller than my own country, Lithuania, which has only 3 million people, but it has three, actually four official languages, free spoken. Uh, the north side, more or less, is German speaking with their own accent. Uh, kind of the more east south side is Italian speaking and east west side is French speaking. So I was going to the French speaking part and I was like, crap, okay, well, I don't know French, but I know English. And I knew that my instructor is gonna be American. So I learned all these facts and I kind of started learning about where I'm heading to. I spent some time with this girl talking until the morning. I guess it was kind of romantic, but I, <laughs> I didn't invest in it. I think she did. Anyway, take, I sit in the train uh, like four in the morning or something and I arrive eventually to the town Nobody's picking me up because I, I, you know, I didn't get on time back then. You know, I don't, I don't think I had like a mobile phone, which would let me connect up at any time. You know, it was a different time back then. So I just searched out for the place and at seven in the morning, I finally find the dojo. I walk in there, a couple of women in welcome me and they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm that guy. And they're like, oh, you actually made it. And we're, we're there almost kind of thing betting whether I'm going to come or not because it's kind of weird, you know, an 18 year, 18 year old guy. Actually, by the time I was going, I was about to turn 19. My birthday was in a few days. And so uh, it was funny because they, they were betting because they were like, you know, eight, an 18 year old guy makes, his, makes just like a random trip to here to live for three months. It's kind of wild, but I did it. And I'm sitting there drinking tea with them and they're asking me, so... When's the, I'm asking them, so when's the next training? And they're like, oh, it's gonna be actually in an hour at eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday. And I was like, oh really? Oh, I'm gonna train. Thing is though, I I never, I never trained, uh, sorry, not, not, not that, I lost my thought. I actually didn't sleep for about 40 hours because in the bus I didn't, I was not able to sleep. Then I spent the whole night on the train, then the train trip, and then I went to dojo. So I didn't sleep like for 40 hours. I'm exhausted after a long trip, barely any food. And I'm like, I'm so pumped. I'm like, let's train. And so I went to the training. I, I, I did the training. It was actually different from what I was used to, but eventually I loved it. Uh, and then after the training, they show me where I'm gonna sleep. And I go to that place and I fall asleep and I just go out cold. I think I woke up after like, I guess like 10 hours or uh, sleeping. I woke up, I go outside, I go to the dojo, and I'm looking around and no one's here. And for me, yeah, the day was really a weird and unusual experience because, um, because, uh, la, 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 sorry. Uh, because in Lithuania, we weren't so trusting each other. We weren't, we were, we were more suspicious about each other. And so it was so unusual for me, a completely unknown person, I just got there and they left me alone. And I mean, not like, alone that I had a trouble with that, but I was just surprised how much they trust me. So I kind of appreciate that as well. But I think uh, one of the ladies invited me to meditate together. We meditated for a bit and then I went to sleep again, like an hour later. And then I slept for like, again, like 14 hours. So, so I ended up sleeping like 20 hours or so. Uh, that's my record up to today. And then, you know, I'm not going to go day by day and tell you that whole story in that way, but just that was that interest, that beginning was, um, was kind of very interesting of, 
how I got there and how Angie things started. Now to kind of start cutting through the story, um, I really loved it there um, and it was, I felt like it's exactly what I was looking for. I was always interested in meditation, spirituality and, and the instructor that, that I took as my teacher, I chose as my teacher, he, he was kind of giving me the right things for that. Uh, he wasn't just a dry martial arts school where you just practice and that's it. We had a lot of talks, we had a lot of discussions, I learned a lot about meditation, yoga. So it was really kind of the right thing and we talked a lot about fulfilling your purpose, pursuing your goals. Uh, so that was very valuable and at the day. And one of the methods which was interesting, it's interesting to reflect about uh, how it worked. Cough there. Was that uh, the Aikido instructor that I learned from, uh, he would invite all of us, the living students, to have a meeting once per week with him, like a personal meeting. We would go out there, sit and have coffee together, and he would ask questions, and uh, you would have to answer, and eventually he would share his wisdom. Uh, thing is, though, I was super ambitious, and I was going there with the knowledge that I want to become an Aikido instructor. And the first meeting we had, I told him, I'm here to become an Aikido instructor. And it was actually a, an interesting moment and something I really appreciate from him is because beforehand, when I was still in Lithuania, my country, and I was um, in high school, at a certain point, I realized I wanted to become an Aikido instructor and I told people and nobody supported me. Like everyone was like saying, you're crazy, Rokas, this is nonsense. And eventually, like at the last few months, I started finding people who did kind of believe in me. But funny thing, there was this one uh, business guy who I liked a lot. He was uh, the boyfriend of my uh, cousin at the day. And he was really enthusiastic about what I was, what I was saying. He was like, yeah, dude, you're gonna make it. And I, I really enjoyed that support from him, especially because he seemed like a smart guy. Years later, like about uh, four or five, I mean, even more like five six years later when I, I came back to Lithuania opened my dojo after the whole thing uh, I text him I found him online I was like hey you know I opened my dojo let's meet up you know I really appreciate your support to help me kind of make it happen and he writes back to me he, actually we never met he wasn't like really going through that place and I never really you know pushed for the meeting but there was a funny moment where he wrote oh really I never really thought you will be able to open your dojo. So I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> and I'm like, holy crap, dude. I thought you're, you know, I thought you believe in me. And I thought you're like, you know, uh, all in. And, and turns out, you know, he was kind of giving me pep talks, but he wasn't really believing that I will be able to do it. So it's kind of funny, but it worked out at, at the moment. But aside from that, I had very few people who supported me. And most people said I'm crazy. When I met, uh, when I went for, the, for a coffee meeting with my Aikido instructor for the first time, he, uh, I told him that I want to become an Aikido instructor and he was the very first person whose intent, instead of trying to talk me out of it, he looked at me and said, well, that means you'll probably have to stay here for longer, get your black belt, blah, 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 this and that. And he took me seriously. And I really appreciated that. That really empowered me. I was like, dude, this is a person who, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And uh, he's, he's good at his stuff. He went through the path. He knows how to make it. And instead of telling me, oh, this is crazy, don't do it, you're too young or anything, he believed that it's possible right away and, and gave me just a list of what I will have to do. So that was great. I really appreciate that moment. And the uh, funny part, though, you know, when you're 18, or at least when I was 18, especially being so ambitious, I... Um, I, time worked differently for me. I guess it does for young people. Is like, everything seems like there's no time. You need to rush, you need to, you know, pick up the pace. You're running out of time. And thing is, um, at the day, like even three months, going out there for three months seemed like forever. I was like, oh, I'm leaving my country forever. I'm gonna come back in three months, you know, all grown up and whatnot. And I did come back changed, but uh, thing is, um, when my instructor said that I will need to stay for longer, like about a year, and get my black belt, I remember at that moment my brain was freaking out. It was like, a year? I can die in a year, you know, this is so long, this is so much, man, damn it, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do? And, and then I kind of settled in, I was like, okay, well, wait, 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 you can do it. Or actually, you know what, 
it's it's even more funnier. He said six months. I think he said he said if I stay for six months, then you know I get my black belt and then I go I'm gonna go open my dojo and um, or start teaching like Kido Mithui. And I was like, crap. I was like, um, well that's a lot. But I was like, okay, I can I can do it. You can do your course. You know, you can you can live through it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on this part of the story because it's so funny and, and kind of interesting for a moment. So what happened next with that particular storyline, uh, I, so I stayed the first time for three months and uh, I moved back to Lithuania uh, because I kind of needed to regather my finances and that was the first initial commitment and also had this heart surgery, really weird, like, like they, they put a wire through my leg and operated my heart and I was watching it on TV while they were doing it. It was really cool. <laughs> but then I couldn't train for a while after I got that surgery and I kind of got in, in a bit of a depressive mode during that period. And while I, I came back to Lithuania, after those three months, I felt I learned so much that I felt like I'm ready to go out there and change the world, you know, again, young ambitiousness. And I tried, I talked to young people, and I, I kind of went, I was kind of inspiring to them, but I didn't really, you know, say the right things. And, and eventually I started to see, okay, man, I'm not there yet. And I almost kind of lost that momentum and uh, got a bit, became a bit depressed and sluggish, you could say, like, like I was like, oh, okay, this didn't really work out. And I actually fell out with my previous Aikido instructor who, who was actually upset that I went to study with this Aikido instructor, which was really weird. I think it's a story worth telling on another video because he, um, yeah, he thought that, you know, not necessarily I'm kind of betraying him, maybe a little bit, but he also felt like uh, he, he, he considered, it was a weird thing he had. He considered everyone outside of him who's studying Aikido, teaching Aikido to be frauds, unless he knew them and unless he told them that they're legit, he's like, oh, he's a fraud, he's a fraud, he's a fraud. He was very judgmental in that way. And he decided that the Aikido instructor that I, le I learned from, despite him, you know, being top of his game, studied with the best of the best, lived in Japan, whatever, he decided he's a fraud and, and, and then he didn't support me, which is crazy. I thought he's gonna be happy that I chose to live the path of Aikido. So it's a long story, but yeah, it was kind of weird. So I fell, I fell out with him and I kind of got lost and confused and didn't have something specific to do. And while I had to, I was initially supposed to come back to Switzerland quite quickly, I kind of stayed over in Lithuania and, and my mood was just going down and down. And then she started to feel like, man, I should probably get back. I should I should continue my, my pursuing my purpose, my goal. But, but what's most interesting and what was most uh, important at that moment is that my uh, mother, who initially my parents, they they weren't super supportive of my choice of that. It's again a great story, but uh, they were telling me this is a mistake. I should first finish university at least and only then do these crazy things. Uh, but eventually they realized I'm hopeless. That's kind of how they said, okay, well, Rokas, you're hopeless. We understand we're not gonna talk you out of it. So we're gonna support you until you will fail. That's That was their initial statement. And they're super good. My parents are amazing uh, and they were supportive, but they thought this is a, a mistake. Uh, and despite that, when my mom saw that I'm kind of going down that depressed road of, of kind of getting lost, becoming lost and confused and not really have anything to do. She, uh, I think uh, from, from what I remember, she actually came to me and said, you know, Rogers, I think you should go back to Switzerland. And that was so an... Uh, so unexpected because beforehand she um, as I said they, they were skeptical about this but I think they saw how pumped I was living there and they saw how kind of purposeless I became without going back there and she suggested for me to go so I greatly appreciate that so it was kind of a mix I was also I was slowly considering to do that myself but kind of postponing it it was on my list but I was I, I don't know why even I, I started to say why I postponed it uh, but um, but also, uh, actually, I do know a little bit. So it's a crazy part, actually. I won't go deep into this, but actually, one of the persons I lived with, sharing the space, she was a really difficult person to live with, and I think that was kind of, I was afraid partly to go back. It's crazy to think back about that now. And it was also an intense experience. So I think part of my psyche was freaking out. I wanted to go back, but I was also afraid. 
but my mom encouraged me and I realized, you know what, it's time. And, and after like eight months passed, I took a bus there again and went out there indefinitely. Now, you know what? What's interesting is I was expecting to finish up this story in 30 minutes, but I see there's so much good stuff there that um, I will, I think I will stop here. I'll make a short break. I'll, I'll put on a sweatshirt, sweater because I'm cold. I wanted to change my clothes to be like, oh, look, I don't wear all the same hoodie all the time, but I'm cold, so I'm going to wear the same hoodie all the time again until it gets warm. But yeah, I'll drink some coffee and I'll continue the story in the second part of this because we don't want to make this too, too, too long. Let's make, let's make this episode one and I'll continue in episode two. So thanks for watching so far. Stay tuned. Uh, keep questioning. And I'll see you soon enough in the next part of this episode.